try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Is that better? Yeah. Well, it's already been a good service. Today, we have the opportunity to do something a little different. Immediately following our service, we'll be having a time of fellowship together. My hope is that the topic of our study this morning will be a fitting message. I hope you plan to stick around for a time of fellowship and that you're eager for our study together. We are going to start by reading from Exodus 33 as a launching point. Exodus chapter 33, beginning at verse 7. Ben is going to manage the uh, PowerPoint for us this morning, so if he thinks I'm going a little too slow, <laughs> we'll be quick to advance the slides. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Let's lift up our time together in prayer. Father, we come before you and thank you that we can come before you as our Father. We lift up this opportunity with your word and fellowship that we would hear what it would have us learn, that it would transform us individually, that it would transform us together as is by your design. We give you thanks for your faithfulness. Please give us a good understanding of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When I come to this passage, I always find it striking. Don't you? Something deep, mysterious, miraculous and wondrous is taking place here. It doesn't just say that God spoke to Moses as a man speaks to a man. No, there's something more personal, tender, and familiar here. In Scripture, language is used to provide a picture of the type of relationship we can have with God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit. We appropriately use words such as Lord, King, Priest, Prophet, Father, Groom, and Brother. Each looks to further explain and explore the relationship we have with God. And in this passage, God chose to identify Himself as one who speaks with a friend. This morning, I'd like for us to explore just some of what the Bible says about friendship. History has been transformed by friendships. Do any come to mind? How about John Adams and Thomas Jefferson? George Washington and Alexander Hamilton? John Newton? And William Cooper, William Wilberforce, and William Pitt. How about your favorite stories 
maybe a book, a play, a TV show, or a movie. Imagine Hamlet without Horatio, Sherlock without Watson, Frodo without Sam, Harry without Ron and Hermione, Rocky without Creed, Maverick without Goose, <laughs> Anne of Green Gables without Diana, or Winnie the Pooh without Piglet. I'm sure many of your favorite stories speak of a devoted friendship. Countless songs have been written and sung about friendship, and I'm sure we could list off many. Soon children will be headed back to school, where friends will be reunited, and new friends will be made. Students arriving at a new school may be anxious about the prospects of making new friends. College students headed to campus, dorms, and classes hoping to make and deepen friendships. Parents will remind their friends to choose their friends well. Their children will choose their friends well and to show themselves friendly. We desire great friendships. If we have children, we desire great friendships for them. Even the marketplace recognizes the value of friendships, but reports that we aren't seeing enough of them. On October 7, 2022, the Harvard Business Review published an article by John Clifton entitled The Power of Work Friends. In the article, Clifton cited Gallup research saying, data shows that having a best friend at work is strongly linked to business outcomes, including improvements in profitability, safety, inventory control, and employee retention. He went on to say that to ignore friendships is to ignore human nature. Friendships are not only good for our productivity, Friendships are good for our health, both mental and physical. On June 1st, 2023, the American Psychology Association published an article by Zara Abrams entitled, The Science of Why Friendships Keep Us Healthy. American culture prioritizes romance, but psychological science is exploring the human need for platonic relationships and the specific ways in which they bolster well-being. Abram states, a review of 38 studies found that adult friendships, especially high-quality ones that provide social support and companionship, significantly predict well-being and can protect against mental health issues such as depression and anxiety. And those benefits persist across the lifespan. People with no friends or poor quality friendships are twice as likely to die prematurely, according to Holt Lundstedt's meta-analysis of more than 308,000 people, a risk factor even greater than the effects of smoking 20 cigarettes a day. The effects of isolation and loneliness are a detriment to our very health. God has designed us for, for relationship and for friendship. On the one hand, friendship seems to be incredibly prized and valued in our day. But on the other, it seems to be incredibly neglected. And it would seem that this is nothing new. Cicero, the Roman lawyer and philosopher, wrote in his work on friendship, Scipio used to complain that men were painstaking in all other things than in friendship. That everybody could tell you how many goats and sheep he had, but was unable to tell the number of his friends. And that men took pains in getting the former, but were careless in choosing the latter. And had no certain signs or marks, so to speak, by which to determine their fitness for friendship. We ought, therefore, to choose men who are firm, steadfast, and constant, a class of which there is a great dearth. At the same time, it is very hard to come to a decision without a trial, while such trial can only be made in actual friendship. <coughs> Thus, friendship outruns the judgment and takes away the opportunity of a trial. 
We may more readily know our finances than we know the number of our friends. People may take great pains to gain wealth, but may be careless in obtaining and choosing their friends. And we have different types of friends, don't we? We have acquaintances, people we see and visit with every now and then. They admit to knowing us and we them. When the opportunities arise, we enjoy each other's company. Hopefully, we have friends and close friends. We know them well and they know us well. We share life together. There's more intentionality. We look for and make opportunities to enjoy each other's company. Then, there are the very closest of friends. We use expressions like cut from the same cloth or knit together. From a very young age, we desire close friendships. Children exchange the coveted title, best friend. Some use the term covenant friends to signify their intentional com commitment to each other. Others may use the terms soul friends. A term I personally am fond of is kindred spirit. The New American Standard Bible translates the Greek in Philippians 2, 19 through 20, as Paul saying this about Timothy. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Some translate this as of soul. Deuteronomy 13.6 uses language and speaks of a friend as your friend who is as your own soul. Some friendships are stronger and deeper than others, but all are to be valued. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and quote C.S. Lewis. <laughs> you may be shocked, but I just want to point out, because I've checked, I haven't quoted him in the last four times that I've been up here. <laughs> so I don't take this lightly. Ben. In his book, The Four Loves, Lewis says, but in friendship, being free of all that, we think we have chosen our peers. In reality, a few years difference in the dates of our births, a few more miles between certain houses, the choice of one university instead of another, posting to different regiments, raised at the, first, uh, the accident of a topic ra being raised or not raised at the first meeting. Any of these chances might have kept us apart. But for a Christian, there are, strictly speaking, no chances. A secret master of the ceremonies has been at work. Christ, who said to the disciples, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friends, You have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to provide a personal illustration. When I was 16, I was introduced to my friend Patrick. For a few years, we were more acquaintances, friends of friends, until we decided that we should start hanging out more regularly. Many years later, we found out we had met before. We realized that we had attended the same vacation Bible school when we were younger, probably 10 or 11 years old. Thinking back on the week, I remembered and mentioned there was a kid who broke his foot. Patrick said that he was that kid, and it was one of the most painful things that he has ever experienced. Up to this point, I thought I had met Patrick for the first time on two separate occasions. Imagine my surprise 
When going through old boxes, I came across a Little League baseball team photo and saw a picture of me at age five and who I believed to be my friend Patrick. I took my phone, zoomed in on a picture so he could see only himself, and sent him a text, is this you? He confirmed. We had been on the same Little League baseball team together. <laughs> Remarkable, right? Now I come from an age of 35 millimeter film. Getting film developed was a whole ordeal. We didn't take as many pictures back then. And beyond that, I am the youngest of four. <laughs> You're already laughing. I don't know about your family, but there seems to be a trend that there are less pictures of the youngest. I'm seeing a lot of heads nod. <laughs> seems to be true for your family as well. So you can imagine my shock when flipping through a photo album, a family photo album that my sister had scrapbooked for me, I found a picture of me and who else? One of the few pictures my parents had taken of me in my illustrious soccer career, which in defense of them was brief, was a picture of me on the sidelines with none other than my friend Patrick. Now what's not to be missed, besides just how popular turtlenecks were, <laughs> and Patrick's amazing bowl cut, is my quintessential dejected and discouraged face, and Patrick by my side, probably trying to encourage me. For those keeping score, I have met Patrick for the first time on at least four separate occasions. <laughs> As C.S. Lewis said, a secret master of the ceremonies had been at work the entire time. God, in his patience and long-suffering, and quite comically, continued to supply opportunities for Patrick and my friendship until we ourselves recognized it. Christ, who said to the disciples, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, truly seemed to be saying, you have not chosen one another but I have chosen you for one another. I could share with you about my friend Paul, who in college just happened to walk into class wearing a t-shirt that sparked a conversation. Since then, we've celebrated life's great wins and joys together, and have also mourned life's great losses. We continue to share life together. Or about Glenn, who after just a few conversations and visits, it was mutually realized and decided upon that given our shared backgrounds, interests, and the timing of our meeting, there was simply too much in common for our friendship to be circumstantial and casual. God had orchestrated it for his purposes. God was and is at work in and through it. These men know my mind know my heart, and know my soul. As the Bible would define them, they are kindred spirits. Now think of your closest friends. What were the circumstances in how you met? How were these friendships formed? What have these friendships experienced since? How has God used these friendships? And how much do these friendships mean to you? Friendships are of great value to God. The Lord used to speak to Moses as a man speaks to a friend. When you think of friendship, I hope wonderful friendships of your own come to mind. But if instead the idea makes you feel lonely, if instead you feel isolated this morning, what better Sunday for us when we have gathered to have fellowship, see what God would have us learn and experience about friendship 
from his word. As we consider friendship this morning, I'd like us to consider God's wisdom for friendship. God's expectations for friendship. And God's offer of friendship. First, God's wisdom for friendship. Friendship is designed by God. While studies, research, and thoughtful writings can be helpful, when we pick up the word, we're getting true wisdom, instruction, and warnings on friendship from the very designer, the very master of ceremonies of friendship himself. There are many verses that speak of friendship. Let's look at a few. Job 614, he who withholds kindness from a friend forsakes the fear of the Almighty. When it is within our power to give kindness towards a friend and we do not, we act as though we don't fear or revere God. God desires us to show kindness towards our friends. Perhaps that's an encouraging text, call, or letter. Perhaps hospitality. Perhaps it's truly lifting them up in prayer and not just saying you know. Or perhaps it's praying with them together. Perhaps it's meeting a practical need. Without too far a stretch, I think it could easily be said that when we extend kindness to our friends, we honor God and display God's love for us and for them. God desires that we watch what we say, because gossip is harmful to flourishing and thriving friendships. Proverbs 16, 28 says, A dishonest man spreads strife, and a whisperer separates close friends. Proverbs 17, 9, Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Do we have our friends' confidence, or are we quick to repeat matters to others? Do we speculate on others' motives, or do we extend grace towards others? If we want thriving friendships, others will be able to trust us. We will not allow gossip or idle talk to separate friendship? Are we loyal, committed, and available to our friends? Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Proverbs 27, 10, Do not forsake your friend and your father's friend, and do not go to your brother's house in the day of your calamity, Better is a neighbor who is near than a brother who is far away. All means all. Do we love at all times? Can we read 1 Corinthians 13 and find a description of our love towards our friends? Are we loyal to our friends? Are we dependable and true? Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, profuse are the kisses of an enemy. When our friends need to rebuke us, how do we receive it? Or when we need to lovingly correct a friend, do we do so gently and privately, or are we harsh? Proverbs 27, 9, oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. Do we receive our friend's counsel and take it to heart, or do we discount and disregard it? Friendships can be difficult. How many of us know that humans aren't perfect, even Christians? In friendship, we can experience disappointment. We can be let down. We can experience heartbreak. Job said his friends scorned him. 
David laments in the 41st Psalm that even his close, trusted friends were against him. Jesus himself knew what it was like to have a friend betray him. He knew what it was like to have his friends disown him and abandon him. God gives us wisdom for friendship, and I believe God has expectations for friendship. God has expectations for friendship. Scripture provides us with many portraits of friendship, both good and bad. We often think of Jonathan and David, perhaps Joshua and Caleb, Paul and Barnabas. We've already mentioned Paul and Timothy. We've also mentioned Job and his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. I have never heard of someone wishing that they had a friendship like these four. But I think it's instructive to us. Job experienced extreme tragedy and suffering. Rather than receiving encouragement and comfort from his friends, they offered accusations, blame, and scorn. This did not go unnoticed by God, and God's re response should not go unnoticed by us. Job 42, 7 says, After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. As we read Job and hear his friends' responses, we too may burn with anger towards them. Where was the truth in what they said? Where was the encouragement? Where was the comfort? Maybe they should have been quiet, listened, and prayed for and with their friend. God had given Job's friends the high office of friendship. They were given a position of standing and influence. And they completely squandered it. How are we doing with our friendships? What are we doing with our standing and our influence? Are we squandering? God tells Job's friends that Job will pray for them and that he will accept Job's prayer not to deal with them according to their folly. And notice this. I've often read right past over these, these next words. To my own embarrassment, look at the timing of Job's restoration. Job 42.10, And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. I don't know if you've skipped over that like I have in the past. But he restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. God restored Job after he had prayed with his friends. Could it be that God desired Job's heart, his forgiveness towards his friends, his reconciliation with his friends? I believe that this shows that God has expectations for our friendships. God cares greatly about our friendships. And why is that? Well, is friendship a kind of love? I believe it is. And if God is love, then our, then our friendships should be a picture of God and His love. Which brings us to God's offer of friendship. Proverbs 18.24 a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Proverbs speaks of a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I believe God wants us to have great friendships because ultimately, the love of friendship, the kind of love, speaks of him. 
John 15, 13 through 15 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Jesus calls his disciples friends. While his immediate audience was his disciples, the apostles, I believe he offers and extends friendship to all of his disciples today. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Those of us who know him and his word well know that he is the only one that makes this possible. Being called friends is nothing that we could have done or achieved ourselves. We are unworthy. By Jesus' work on the cross, we can become a friend of God. Those who believe in him, who call on his name and turn away from their sin, where we once stood in judgment, in our sin, we are told we can now be received as friends. When you see a friend, and you haven't seen them in a long time, how do you receive them? When you see a friend and you've seen them a couple hours before, how do you receive them? This week I was actually getting gas and my friend was on the other side, I'm, very, I'm a very aware person, my friend was on the other side pumping gas and I saw them and we gave each other a big hug and I thought, this probably looks a little strange to people. I don't typically hug everybody that I pump gas with on the side. Jesus said, that whoever has seen him has seen the Father. Christ is the fulfillment of everything we seek in friendship. Think of all the qualities you would wish for in a friend. Now think of Jesus. He has all the character and love of a true friend. He is the very personification of the love of friendship. He is true. He is loyal, enduring, patient, forgiving, kind, loving, and available. And what is it that he commands of us? That we love one another as he has loved us. We have been chosen, we have been appointed, that we would bear fruit, that we would love one another. What does that kind of love look like? Romans 12, 9 through 13 tells us, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. The heading of Romans 12 in your Bible may read, Marks of the True Christian. I think it could easily read, Marks of a True Friend. It's a love that is to be extended and offered. Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He sought those who were isolated and lonely in life and their sin. He approached people when they were having a frustrating day at work and didn't catch any fish. He approached people who were sitting by the road. He approached mourners. He invited himself over to people's houses. He went searching for these people. He fed the hungry. He healed them. 
And he did whatever he did to pursue you and me and make himself known to us. Jesus extended friendship beyond his immediate friends, and he tells us to do the same. In Luke 14, 12 through 14, Jesus said, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. The offer of friendship has been given to us so that we can extend it to others. There are many among us who are hungry for friendship. There are many among us who are in great need of the love and friendship Jesus Christ offers. Friendship is a gift of God and provides us an opportunity to love like Christ loves. Our greatest friendships are but a picture of how God loves us and enjoys us. Let's not squander our moments and neglect our friendship with those around us. Let's steward the opportunities God gives us and extend loving friendship. He has expectations of our friendships. And let us not neglect our friendship with Jesus himself, that deep love and relationship that he has offered us. Let's pray. Father, you have so richly blessed us with your love in so many different forms, and so many di different dynamics. The fact that we could be friends with the creator of the universe. That we could be friends with the artist of the creation. That we would experience your friendship. We give you thanks. Lord, we lift up our friendships to you. Help us to be the friends that you would have us be. Help us to be like Jesus, to extend friendship to those around us, Lord, so that we can display your love that you have given to us, and so that we can display your love to others. Lord, we lift up this time together. We pray for the fellowship that we will have, for the discussions, for the catching up, for the laughter, as people share food, they share their hearts, they share their minds, we share this time together, we ask your blessing on it, Lord, we give you thanks for making it possible, both in this facility and, and with this weather, may we feel your spirit move in this place, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.